Okay, right. So uh, starting with the 2014 A-levels, question number six. Did you all uh, do the questions, guys? Yes. The ones on at least until 16 to 18 would have taken you around two hours, two and a half hours to five. Yes, make sure that you all write answers, okay? Because if you are not writing answers, again, there is no point. There is no point just coming and listening to me talking. Okay, make sure that, you know, pen on paper, answers are properly written. Okay, so 2014, question 6, subsection 1. Explain using a diagram the relationship between income and money demand for transaction. And they have given you 5 marks. Now, this is a very easy question, no? They are asking you to explain the transaction demand for money. So, what and what can you write? You can start off with saying, okay, the demand for money, okay, you can say, maybe you can start off with a small definition. You can say, uh, the demand for money uh, for the transaction motive, let's say, um, what can we start off with? How did you start off your answer? There are different, different things that you can write, right? You can uh, talk about demand for money for the transaction motive depends on uh, consumer's disposable income. You can uh, start off and then say, mm, what is this? This is the money. Okay, you can start off by saying, this is the money balances that people keep with them for what? People keep with them for their day-to-day -day transactions no what is demand for money on the transaction motive the money that people keep with them okay so maybe you can start off with saying what is demand for money as well you can say demand for money is the preference of people to keep money in the form of money itself with them then demand for money under the transaction motive refers to the money that people keep with them for what for their day-to-day -day transactions okay for what for their day-to-day transaction. Day-to-day transaction. Then you can go and write, okay, the demand for money on a transaction motive will depend on a consumer's disposable income. When consumer's disposable income rises, what happens? When consumer's disposable income rises, the Demand for money under the transaction motive will rise and vice versa. Yeah, and therefore, you can say there is a positive relationship between the demand for money and demand for money under the transaction motive and disposable income. And then you can go a little bit more and talk about also, guys. Now, why do people keep money for their day-to-day -day transactions? Because there is a gap between receiving income and your expenditure, no? You receive income at the end of the month. Usually people, they get their salary at the end of the month. Okay, So your income doesn't come every day. Your income, let's say, comes at the end of the month. End of the month. But if you look at your expenditure, okay, your expenditure, there is... Your expenditure usually happens daily. You're getting money only at the end of the month. But your expenditure happens daily. You know, every day you have to spend on something. So in order to bridge that, see, income comes at the end of the month. Your expenditure happens daily. In order to bridge that or in order to match your expenditure only, people demand for money. You can write that as well. So, and after you've uh, written those positive relationship, okay, you can talk about that there is a positive relationship. Also make sure that you draw the graph. Because why? Because they are also saying to draw the graph here, you know, uh, using a diagram. So when you're drawing the diagram, you can say, look here, this is disposable income, or you can even say real income, guys, no problem. Okay? The gap is transaction. No, no, not the gap, guys. The, how they match that gap is by demanding for money, by keeping money with them. Because they are getting income at the end of the uh, month, but expenditure happens on a daily basis. So in order to, you know, solve that issue or in order to match that income and the expenditure only, they keep money with them for their transactions. Okay. 
and then you can talk about this is uh, money demand for the transaction motive and you can draw a, a okay or we can say this is uh, money demand okay and this is the money demand for the transaction motive so you can say look here when the income uh, rises the demand for money will also right something like that should be a good enough diagram so you will ideally get one mark for a diagram you will get four marks for your explanation so once again what are the things that you need to explain you can start off with saying what is demand for money then talk about what is demand for money under the transaction motive then you can say that demand for money under the transaction motive depends on your disposable income then say that look here it is a positive relationship when this income increases demand for money on the transaction motive will increase and same vice versa when it decreases then you can go and say you know uh, people's income there is a, a mismatch between when people receive income and when their expenditure is made because income is usually received by the end of the month but expenditure happens on a day-to-day -day basis so in order to bridge this or in order to match this income with expenditure that is why people keep money with them and then you can draw a graph and you can explain so it's one of the easiest five marks that you can score ideally guys uh, you need to have the accessors correct so uh, usually the horizontal axis over here this is the uh, which variable dependent or the independent the horizontal axis on a normal mathematically correct graph this is the indie this is the independent variable okay? the one that doesn't depend on anything and uh, this one is the dependent variable but only in price and quantity demanded remember the demand curve and supply curve that is mathematically wrong in the demand curve and supply curve we put qd in the horizontal axis so that for some reason they have drawn it wrong that's mathematically not correct okay uh, can you write about precautionary motive no don't because uh, that means you've not understood the question properly because they are saying income and money demand for transaction so if you write precautionary motive that is showing the examiner this fellow doesn't know what exactly the money demand for transaction means if they talk about uh, demand for money and income, then you can say our ah, transaction motive, precaution motive, both depends on income, you can talk about. But here they have specifically told transaction, so don't need to talk about income. Sorry, speak you, uh, precautionary motive. Uh, any questions there, guys? Part one? Fine. Not hard, no? Kind of easy question. So on your end, guys, practice for the other two also. What if they ask you the same question in your year for precaution? What if they ask the same question for speculating? So for five marks, you practice. Now that is why you need to do past papers. And you think, right? Always when you all are doing past papers, remember, in your year, what you're going to get is they're going to twist the question a little. So how can they twist this question? They can ask you uh, money demand for precaution. They can ask you the same question. They can ask you draw and explain the diagram for speculating. So can you do that? For five marks okay then part two this one again remember we had a, another past paper before also that talked about okay, that uh, talked about credit cards are not money we discussed that uh, in one of the previous papers no i think 2000 uh, in six also we take horizontal five no, so income is the, um, we'll come to that, we'll come to that, right? The, the y equals e graph doesn't really matter much because it's like a 50-50 uh, same scale thing. I'll come to that mathematical parts there, okay? Uh, coming to two, why credit cards are taken into account while debit cards are not when determining money supply? Now, this is a little bit confusing, no? Remember earlier in a past paper, they said, and there's a same question repeated in the next year also. They said, right, in uh, 2011, they said, explain why credit cards are not money. Then remember I told you, I told you credit cards is not an asset, 
right? It's a means of getting a loan. Uh, and, you know, whenever you swipe your credit card, what are you doing? You're kind of getting a short term loan. And then at the end of the month, you have to settle that, you know, that kind of thing we explained. No? And we said in 2011, what did we say? We said that credit cards, credit cards are not money. Now look at this case. We are saying credit cards are not money. But this year they are asking us that they are saying credit cards are taken into money supply. Credit cards are not money, but they are taken into money supply. Debit cards are not. To explain why. Okay. It's an interesting story again, guys. Please do you all remember in unit number seven, when we talk about uh, credit creation, remember when we talk about credit creation, how does a bank give you a loan usually? I guess I'm also planning like a, a seminar series for your banks. Uh, remember I sent you all a, a Google form to fill any areas that are difficult. So I'm looking at uh, having a seminar series. Currently I've finalized around eight topics. Uh, I'll share them on the past paper group as well. I share it with my mock exam students starting most likely the mid of uh, October time. Okay, that's the plan. I have not finalized anything. I'll, when I, once I finalize, I'll let you all know there will be a limited amount of slots that you all can register. Yeah. Okay. So uh, how do you, how do they give a loan guys? Do they usually give the money to your hand or do they do something else? How does a bank give you a loan? The basics. What do they say guys? Okay, right. Through the access results, fine. Now, let's say you went to the bank. Okay, you went to the bank and uh, your loan got approved. Are they going to give the money to your hand? Or what else are they going to do? If not, what do they do, guys? They tell you to open an account and they put the money to your account. No, that is how it goes. No, When you go and take a loan lamai from a bank, they don't give you physical cash to you first. They tell you, ah, sir, a loan account ka khada ga muapi. And you know, and they put the money to that account. After that, you can withdraw that money. You get the loan approved. Uh, you, you know, go to the counter, uh, write a check, go, go to the ATM or whatever you do, you can uh, withdraw that money. So usually when you take a loan, what happens? When you take a loan, they create an account for you, a deposit account, maybe a, a loan account, or maybe, I don't know, a demand deposit or something. They put the money to your account first. So. Whenever they make a loan, where does the money first go? The, the money goes into your account as a deposit. Whenever you take a loan, we learn this in credit creation, okay? So I'm leaving that aside now. I'm hoping you all know that the money goes into a deposit. Now, see, we'll, with that understanding, we'll try to read this here. The loans taken through credit cards are included under credit to private sector. According to the M2 definition, now according to our M2 definition, Lamai, what do we have? We say M2 is equal to currency held by public, demand deposits of the public in commercial banks, uh, time and savings deposits of the public in commercial banks. That is what M2 is. Now, now this deposit part, you will wonder, sir, there is nothing called a credit to private sector so in M2. Yes, this uh, demand deposits and time and savings deposits are your total deposits. No? So whenever the government, not the government, whenever the commercial bank gives a loan, what did I tell you? They put it into one of an account. No? A deposit gets created, right? Whenever they give you a loan, maybe in your uh, personal account or some account, they put the money there. So what happens is whenever you swipe your credit card, there is kind of, it might not, there are not, there might not be a physical movement of cash, okay? But theoretically, what happens is there is a little bit of a deposit that goes up here, okay? That's what they're saying. Uh, included under the credit to private sector according to M2 definition. A credit card is a mode of granting loans. The amount of loan that the credit card holder obtained through the credit card is included in the money supply. Because why? This is new money being created, Lamai. Whenever you're taking a loan, new money gets created. So that also becomes a part of your money supply. Money gets added into your account. That kind of a thing you all need to write. Then on the other hand, now credit cards are taken into money supply. Debit cards are not. Why? Why are debit cards not taken into money supply? 
what's the uh, reason behind that? What's the reason behind not taking debit cards into Manasa? Hmm? Because if you take debit cards into money supply, you're double counting, no? Don't you all think? What can you withdraw from your debit card? You can withdraw whatever money that is there in your uh, demand deposit or whatever money that is there in your savings account. You can withdraw using your debit card. So if you take M2, the money in your demand deposit, the money in your time and savings deposit, it's already there. It's a savings account also, you can use a debit card. Now, the normal debit card you have is for your savings account. You all don't have a current, uh, current account. No? Debit cards are there for both current and savings account. So if you are using your debit card, now you can't say, no, I have 100,000 in my savings account and I have 100,000 in my debit card. Doesn't make sense, no? Because the Money that you can get from your debit card is the money that is there in your savings account or demand deposit. So if you again count your debit card balance, what does that mean? You're double counting it. That's what happens. That's why we don't include debit card balances into money supply. Here, in contrast, debit cards are issued against already existing bank deposits. Already existing bank deposits. Such deposits are already included in the money supply even if the debit card is used or not, even though you swipe your debit card or not, that money is already there. Under M2, under demand deposits and uh, savings deposits, that debit card, uh, the balance is there. So you don't have to, every time you swipe the debit card, you don't have to include that additional amount again in, what? in money supply here. Hence, the payments made by debit cards causes a double counting if you go and include this also it becomes what it becomes a double counting issue that is why we don't include that is that clear guys once again why are credit cards included credit cards are included because every time uh, someone goes and swipes a credit card a loan is created so remember the basics when usually a loan is created there is a money that is going into your account. No, the bank deposits some money into your account. That kind of a logic is there. We learn that under credit creation. So therefore, what happens? We include it there. Then in terms of debit cards, why don't we include debit cards into money supply? Because that money is already inside money supply. It's already there no, under demand deposits or savings deposit that is already there. So again, when you go and include, you'll be double counting. So therefore, you don't include debit cards. When money decreases, when we swipe the debit card, yes, your uh, money supply won't know. Now, let's say you go to the ATM and you withdraw money. Okay, what happens? Your demand deposits will fall or your savings deposit balance will fall. Currency held by public will increase. Money supply will not be affected just because you withdraw money from your debit card balance. There can be a bigger impact on people preferring to have cash. Will not go there for now. Uh, isn't the debit card money supply include narrow money? Yes, it's there narrow money. Given that it's there for narrow money, it's also there in M2. No? What is inside narrow money is also there under uh, broad money. You, you, It's perfectly correct for you to say that it's inside M2. Okay. Uh, any other questions, guys, on question three? Sorry, question two. No. Then we'll go into the next one. What are the objectives of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka? How are these objectives achieved? Lamai, this can be a question that can be tested in the recent years, 2023, uh, maybe your year, maybe 2024 in the future. Why? Because in 2023, that is uh, our current year that we are currently doing this, it is applicable for the future also, a new Central Bank Act was passed. A new CBSL Act was passed. Okay, A new Central Bank Act. So in this Central Bank Act, they made certain changes. Uh, you don't have to go into very specific, but the main thing that they did 
is they made the central bank gave them more in the uh let's say they made it more independent now usually what happens central bank is sometimes highly influenced by the government the president says uh, uh, i want to do this uh, central bank will do it that is how it happened you know, when gota was there gota and cabral was the gota was president cabral was the central bank governor back in 2019 2020 those times so highly you know influence now what they did is this is because of the imf uh, told us to not that because we like uh, imf told us to make the central bank independent to make sure that there are no political appointments now for example someone like cabral should have been a political appointment i don't know exactly how they are related or connected but gota would have you know appointed this guy because they know uh, maybe they are old friends or something like that but now you can't do so the central bank now with the new central bank act the main focus guys is to make sure there is independence so mainly yes independence from the government central bank has to be an independent party now no one can influence the ministry of finance or the government's treasury or the parliament or the president no one can come and intervene so that was the main thing that they kind of changed and again in the central bank act again the objectives are there uh, same objectives price stability financial system stability and they also made a more important statement remember if you talk about the objectives of the central bank one is a uh, price stability okay that is number one then you have another thing called financial system stability you no know? price stability and the financial system stability these are the two objectives you know? now these objectives also did not change but in the new central bank now these two are equally important objectives in the new central bank act they specifically mention by any chance if we had to choose between this and this okay yes uh, economic you can put economic okay right like the economic and price stability okay by any chance now usually you don't have to choose between this by achieving uh, economic and price stability you can also achieve financial system have no problem at all but the central bank act specifically said by any chance if these two become conflicting in the future at any point we will prioritize we will prioritize what they are going to prioritize oh, there you go okay they are going to prioritize economic and price stability they will if they had to i am not saying that uh, these are conflicting don't get me wrong okay i am saying at any point in the future by any chance if they had to choose between do we make sure there is economic and price stability or do we make sure there is financial system stability they are going to go with economic and price stability so those kind of new things got added so because of that i feel it can be a question maybe it's a little too recent also the new central bank act came somewhere around it was proposed last month uh, i can't remember the exact date and stuff so sometimes it can maybe even a mcq level they can ask you uh, what is the main motive or why did sri lanka uh, let's say get into a new central bank act why did they publish or why did they gazette a new central bank act? the main reason is to make sure that the central bank is more in the to give it more independence that is the main thing just have that in mind then uh, what are the objectives there are a lot of current issues and all i will we'll talk about in the seminar series also under each unit mm, okay so how can you write this for five marks lama what is uh, economic and price stability economic and price stability refers to ensuring especially price stability to ensure that the prices in economy especially the inflation now why do they give so much of importance to inflation why not unemployment why not economic growth why not uh, something else why is inflation or price stability so important because you know why once you keep prices stable everything else automatically falls in line la bhai because that's the main problem now now just check last year in 2022 very high levels of inflation no as a result what happened 
to curtail that inflation, government had to use their monetary policies, fiscal policies, right? There were uh, huge falls in economic growth. Economic growth was negative. See, once prices go unstable, everything goes collapses. Okay, there was uh, on one side, the currency depreciated. On another side, uh, economic growth was bad. You know, so if you can keep prices stable, now what that is what they have been doing all this time. Now. If you can keep prices stable, eventually little by little by little everything else will also be stable that's why price stability is very important so what is this price stability price stability is about uh keeping what keeping the price level the price level in the economy in the economy so once they keep the price level stable, everything else under now, remember is economic and price stability. No? So uh, unemployment, economic growth, exchange rates, the balance of payment, the fiscal balances, everything kind of becomes stable. But that is what economic and price stability means. Then how can they achieve this Lamai practically? How do they uh, achieve uh, price stability practically? Now, they are asking that and how these objectives are achieved. How do they achieve this? Thing? Using what? In order to... How do they achieve uh, price stability? Mm -hmm. Come on. What does central bank do to achieve price stability? Mainly their monetary policy, no? That's what they have been doing, no? All this time. How did the central bank control inflation and keep prices stable? Using their what? Using their monetary policy. So you can, uh, now see, they, this can be, again, a current context question in your one. Okay? So they can tell you 2022 was a year with high levels of price instability. So explain how the central bank, okay, central bank met their objective of price stability Okay, or oh, explain what the central bank did to uh, keep prices stable or oh, explain what the central bank did in order to achieve their objective of price stability despite all of this happening. So you need to say, look here, they use their monetary policy and then under monetary policy, what do you do? You control, uh, you have the policy interest rates, uh, that is the standing deposit, standing lending rates, you have uh, open market operations, you have SRR. So you use all of this again to control your money supply and thereby price levels. And addition to this case, you can also talk about a little bit about the fiscal policy also, because the fiscal policy also has an impact on prices. No. If you increase government spending, reduce taxes, aggregate demand goes up, aggregate demand goes up, prices will go up. So using the fiscal policy also, there is some sort of impact, but mainly it's the monetary policy for uh, economic and price stability. Is that okay, guys, on economic and price stability? Fine. Any uh, questions there? Then, guys, into this, the financial system stability. What is the financial system? Now, what is the financial system? Inside the financial system, we have financial markets. We have financial institutions, banks, uh, finance companies, insurance companies. We have financial instruments, treasury bills, treasury bonds, shares, uh, commercial papers, debentures, all of those. You know, there's so much components inside the financial system. So financial system stability means to ensure that the financial system is stable and is not vulnerable for any external shock. Any internal low external shock. Let's say, for example, let's say COVID gets hit. COVID comes in. Uh, let's say the whole uh, country. Let's say no, there is no foreign money coming in. Let's assume. Still, no matter what happens, let's say there is an external shock, our financial system has to be smoothly running. Now, let's say, for example, now you all, it's not in your period though. In 2008 and all, right, the world, uh, went into a recession. There was the housing market collapse and there was a, a whole issue there. Now, when that happened, what happened? 
all Sri Lankan markets were affected, guys. I'll just give you a, I'll, uh, I'll give you a nice example of this, the Asian financial crisis. Okay, now it Sri Lanka wasn't affected much. This happened in somewhere around. Just an example. I don't write this in your paper. 1998-2000, okay, if I'm not mistaken, that period. What happened? The Asian financial crisis. You can uh, Google a little. Okay. So this in this Asian financial crisis, you know what happened? Especially countries like Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, Vietnam. They were the ones, South Korea. Okay. They were the ones who were affected. So what happened was, this was the period where a lot of foreign money started to come into these regions, okay, the uh, all these countries for production. And then what happened? All of a sudden, there was uh, some issue with US and all of their stuff. People started pulling out this money. So just imagine, you now to Sri Lanka also, so much of money has come in in terms of uh, to buy our treasury bills and bonds, to buy uh, shares, all of money has come in. What if all of a sudden next day everyone pulls out that money? Everyone says, no, we don't want to invest with you. We are going to put this somewhere else. Now, that was what happened in the Asian financial crisis. So everyone started taking their money. Foreign investors who have invested in these countries took their money out. And when foreign investors take their money out, on one end, the exchange rate started going crazy. And also there was a threat on the financial system. So remember, guys, uh, what is a bank run, Lamai? What's a bank run? A bank run. A bank run is when everyone tries to withdraw their money from the bank. Now you all know, whenever we go and deposit money, what do commercial banks do? With that money, they give out loans. No, commercial bank doesn't have the money that we have put. In. But the belief that whenever we want, we can go and take our money. That is what banks are functioning on. The whole banking system in a country functions because of why? Because of the fact that we believe whenever we want, we can go and withdraw our money. Because we have that confidence, because we have that belief only banks are working. Because in reality, banks don't have our money. Because whatever we go and deposit, banks have given it to, given out as loans. So imagine what if everyone goes at one point and starts withdrawing their money. Banks don't have it. Now, that is what you call a bank run. Now, this happens when a country collapses. Now, for example, let's say, I'll, I have given this example in class also. Let's say you go to uh, the commercial bank. Okay, you go to, okay, let's say you go to, uh, you go to uh, Sampath Bank, let's say. Okay, so you go to Sampath Bank. Okay, now you're a very rich customer. What are you going to do? Let's say you're going to make a withdrawal. You're going to make a withdrawal of 5 million. Okay. So you try to make a withdrawal of 5 million. Then Sampath Bank says, look here, sir. Today we don't have money. Can you come tomorrow? Now just imagine what you're going to do then. You're going to call your closest relatives and tell, look here. I went to Sampath Bank today. I went to withdraw my money. I think some problem is there in the bank. They were not able to give me my 5 million. They told me to come tomorrow. Then what happens? News spreads like wildfire. No, You tell your closest fellows. Your closest fellows will tell their closest fellows. It will go on and on. And at the end, what happens? People will think, ah, Sampath Bank is crashing. They don't have our money. Okay? And you know how news spreads. No, It becomes double, triple and goes. Right? One fellow says, I couldn't withdraw my 5 million. The other fellow will... Change it and say, look here, this fellow went to uh, withdraw, let's say, uh, 50,000. That also they couldn't give. You know, I'm sure our money is also not there. Let's go and take. So all of a sudden, now what happens? Everyone starts trying to withdraw money using some partner. Now that can affect another other banks also. Now other people will think, what if it's not only some bank? What if the other banks also don't have the money? Let's withdraw the money and keep. Now if everyone starts going to the bank, running to the bank to get their money out. That is what you call a bank run. Now, if that happens, the entire banking system will collapse. Because if the moment one bank collapses, easily other banks will collapse. Because let's say one bank ran out of money. Okay. One, uh, one bank ran out of money and yes, the Silicon Bank, it was affected in US. Let's say one uh, bank runs out of money. What are you going to do, Lamai? Now, this thing, 
you have accounts in three banks one bank ran out of money now you can't get your money out are you going to keep your money in the other two banks and wait ah oh, no no these two banks are good people they won't do that to us no no you're going to be like what if these fellows also uh go the bad i will take my money and keep in the form of cash because the moment one bank crashes eventually everything crashes the whole financial system will collapse so central bank's objective as financial system stability is to make sure that does not happen so how can the central bank make sure that does not happen how to make sure that this financial system doesn't collapse what can they do guys so what is financial system stability ensuring that the financial system is properly functioning stably without any issues even though there is external or internal uh let's say shocks that the system goes properly so to do this guys what can they uh, do to make sure that this financial system is properly functioning what kind of things they do guys one is they have to properly monitor okay so they have to have proper uh, monitoring that is happen then central bank has certain rules and regulations certain compliance standards okay so they have uh, certain uh, rules and regulations even this guy is lender of last resort remember we say when commercial banks don't have money they will first ask their neighboring bank that 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 last option last option what will happen last option they will go and uh, ask from the central bank right as the lender of last resort let's say no one has money central bank will at least print and give so even acting as a lender of last resort is a uh, what is to make sure that the financial system is stable now what if the central bank calls says no i don't have money then the commercial bank might collapse no customers are coming and asking commercial bank asked their neighboring banks they also don't have last option they went to central bank central bank says no we also don't have then what will happen again a bank run will start so central bank won't let that happen if they realize that one of the bank is collapsing and going bad they will you know uh at least print money and give them now this is a huge thing guys now it's it's not there much in your syllabus lamai but in the recent uh few months and all a lot of commercial banks have invested in uh, treasury bills and bonds government treasury bills and bonds now remember we talked about debt restructuring unit number 8 how the government is now doing a domestic debt and a external debt restructure so government treasury bills and bonds so all of that now they are trying to restructure they are trying to extend the maturity they are trying to reduce the interest rate so all of that will have a big hit on the banks so uh, luckily our domestic debt restructure they did not touch the treasury bills and bonds held by banks but in case if they did that would have been a huge issue on banks even could have led to a bank run banks would have you know their money would have gone for a six their revenue flows would have been impacted badly and if people started withdrawing by any chance you know that happens so this has happened guys you all just search for a bank run and see in so many countries is there where people go now have you all seen this protesting uh like you all have, we saw the aragale you know so that's how a bank run works guys everyone will go crashing into a bank okay at the moment they say uh, you can't get your money these fellows will break the atms these will do crazy it has been happening in the recent days in countries people break the atms they try to take their money you know it's uh, just like how the aragale went so that's a very serious issue so central bank will not allow that to is that okay guys uh, yes they are trying to change bills into bonds uh, will not go into very detail on to those the restructure it's very interesting but you know uh, not really into our syllabus much uh, fine guys chip the objectives a little bit of current context and all okay. then question number 4 explain the qualitative credit control measures used by the central bank you know uh, internal shock is like for example uh, something like your domestic debt restructure going wrong your domestic debt restructure going wrong so now all the people are going to uh, get the money external shock is something that comes from outside something like covid okay uh, okay explain the qualitative credit control measures used by the 
uh, kind of exchange rate affects the objectives. Mm, by managing the exchange rate, you can allow help the others also, but not very directly. I say because not allow the collapse, but some has collapsed. In Sri Lanka, no, right? In Sri Lanka, none of the banks have collapsed. Now, certain finance companies have collapsed. Central bank has. Uh, now that's why, you know, guys, the central bank, in terms of rules and regulation, central bank is the one who gives license for commercial banks. No, no one can just come and become a commercial bank. No, there are licenses. You know, they have proper standards to uh, to disclose certain information. They are financial reporting. They have certain uh, capitalization requirements, right? They have to have a minimum capital of this much. You know, those kind of stuff are there. If you go to a co commercial bank's financial statements, now we do this in office also. Uh, there is a tier one capital. There is something called uh, tier two capital, tier three capital. You know, there are requirements, guys. Central bank has said, look here, you have to have this much, this much amount of money. So that is to make sure that the bank doesn't collapse. So they have given, right? You can't uh, do nonsense. You can't do whatever you want. Those kind of rules, regulations, everything is there, guys, to make sure the system is stable and functional. So far, none of the banks in Sri Lanka have collapsed. Okay. So can you all give me some uh, things for this case until I have some water? Qualitative credit control measures. What and what do we have? Hmm? Okay, moral suasion. Fine. What else? Okay. So, what is moral suasion? What is a uh, moral uh, suasion? Okay, there is moral suasion. There is okay. Uh, if credit limits, or we can say credit ceilings. Okay. Limits or ceilings. You can have what? Uh, changing the co collateral requirements. Yeah. Collateral uh, requirements. What else? Now, you'll have to at least give five lamai. Okay, you can talk about uh, controlling the direction of bank credit. Okay. Uh, controlling the direction of uh, bank credit. Anything else? Is only four. Monetary policy communication is more like moral suasion. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else? Okay, preferential interest rates. What is preferential interest rate? Uh, direction bank, I'll come to all of this, guys. Refinancing, okay, right, okay. Right, we'll talk about what this mean. What does this mean? What does uh, moral suasion mean? Yes, I'm not going to write everything, but what does moral suasion mean? Moral suasion is where the central bank gives guidance. Central bank says, look here, uh, this is what we want to do. Okay, now, that happened recently also. Remember, I shared in the past paper class group, now, central bank currently have reduced their standing deposit, standing lending facility. Right? They have reduced the rate so that the other market rates also go down. But the banks didn't reduce. So, central bank said, look here, the governor wrote a letter to all the commercial banks publicly and told, look here, my objective is to now reduce these rates and promote economic growth. So, please cooperate with me. That is what you call moral suasion. You don't come and put rules and regulations, say, do this, do that, otherwise let's see what happens. No, no. They just still, right? Uh, I am trying to do something like this. Please cooperate with me. That kind of thing is what moral suasion means. Then what is uh, credit limits or ceilings? So this is where you put maximum credit limits. So we say the uh, central bank will say, now if they don't want money going into the construction industry. So they say, look here, from your loans, give only 5% to the construction industry. Don't give more than that. So if you all have 100,000, only 5,000 should go over the construction industry. And put uh, ceilings also. Let's say, for example, maximum loan you can give is only 50,000 for a construction per. Don't give more than that. You know, that is what you call credit limits. 
So saying maximum 100,000, not giving loans more than that. Okay. Then changing the collateral requirements. What, are, what is this? Usually when you want to get a loan, you have to provide something as collateral. No? In terms of, let's say, sometimes you have to give your house as collateral and then really they'll give you the loan. Otherwise, you won't uh, get the loan. So you can, if you want to reduce the amount of loans, what you can do is you can increase the collateral requirement. You say, okay, if you want to have a loan, if you want to get a loan, you have to give your house as collateral. You have to give this, you have to give that, you have to show this, you have to show uh, income slips of uh, uh, the last five years, right? You have to show this, that, that all. So if you do that, then people won't get loans, no? So you can reduce that there as well. Then uh, controlling the direction of bank credit. Direction of bank credit is which sector the bank credit is going to. So government can say right now, uh, you know, give loans to the industries that are bringing in foreign currency. So uh, right now we have a shortage of foreign currency. You know? So central bank can say, okay, give loans maybe to the export sector, the garment factories, the, the tea industry, because they are bringing foreign currency country. So give loans to them. Give loans to the tourism sector. Right? Because they are also bringing foreign currency into the country. Uh, other parts don't. right? Don't give uh, loans to uh, motor vehicle importers. Don't give loans to these importers, those importers. You know, they can control the direction that way. They can say, look here, go there. A uh, credit limit case is more like a maximum credit. Limit. Say, now this is more like a numerical case. In a credit limit, somewhat similar. But in a credit limit, they say, okay, maximum 100,000. Don't give uh, loans more than that. In direction of credit, they say, okay, right, give it to this, give it to this, but don't give it to these people, that kind of a thing. Somewhat similar, but not exactly the same thing. And then again, same thing with preferential interest rates, guys. Now, preferential interest rates, again, central bank will say, okay, for if they want to, uh, let's say, develop the small and medium scale businesses, then they will say, okay, for small and medium scales, give loans at a lower interest rate. So they are getting a preferential interest rate. They are getting a more special rate. Or let's say for tourism sector. Uh, now, for example, I'll give you all for solar. Okay, there was, I don't know if it's still there. But if anyone wants to get uh, a solar panel or a solar system, now that uh, reduces the amount of power created by this one, no? by the uh, by uh, fuel and all. So what did the government do and the central bank? They said, okay, if anyone wants to get solar, will give loans at a lower interest rate. Normal loan interest rate is uh, 10%. But if you're taking this loan to buy a solar panel and uh, fix that into your system, into your house and all, we'll give this loan at, let's say, 7%. That's what you call preferential interest rate. For certain sectors, sometimes the government, with, along with the central bank, tells the commercial banks to look here, reduce the interest rates for these people and give. That's preferential interest rate. So all of those are qualitative credit control measures. Now, here, guys, they have not asked you to. Moral suasion is guidance, guys, telling the uh, commercial banks, look here, you know, this is my objective. So you also please follow this. You also try to, you know, uh, cooperate with me like this and get this done. That is what moral suasion is. So remember, guys, they are asking you to explain. They're not asking you to state five. So explaining also, now you can't explain pages and pages in my so your ideal format has to be in five paragraphs. Okay. Your ideal format has to be in five paragraphs. Five paragraphs. Each paragraph have a, uh, you know, let's say around three to four line explanation. That kind of answer is what you should have. This is our margin requirements. Also, you can give love. Okay. So what are margin requirements? Uh, what are margin requirements? Now. Uh, margin requirements on uh, letter of credit on LCs. So remember, recently central bank increased the margin requirement. What is this? Central bank said, okay, uh, to commercial banks, commercial banks increased it. When we wanted to reduce imports, the commercial banks had a, almost, I think, a 100% margin requirement. That is, let's say if you want to import something worth 1 million, you have to deposit another 1 million in the bank and keep. Then only you can uh, import something worth 1 million. That's what you call like a margin requirement. If you want to uh, buy a car for 5 million from abroad, now we can't buy cars, we'll just assume. We'll, if you want to buy a car from 5 million from abroad, another 5 million you have to uh, put into my bank and keep. 
So then what happened? Then everyone, they reduced their imports into half. Let's say I wanted to import something worth 100,000. Now bank is saying if I want to import something worth 100,000, put another 100,000 in, in my account and keep. So what do people do? Now, because I only have 100,000, I import stuff only worth 50,000. So I import stuff worth 50,000, other 50,000 I put in the bank and keep. See, imports were kind of cut into half. So the loans and all this letter of credits again reduced. That is what this margin requirements on LCs mean. Can also be considered as a qualitative credit control measure. So remember, guys, your answer has to be in paragraphs. Okay, then don't write everything in one big paragraph. Uh, LCs are letter of credit scales. Remember, you all learn for business studies and all. When you are the importer and exporter, you open letter of credits and how the money goes. I'm not going into that theory part. How the money goes. Uh, hoping you all remember those. Okay, uh, is this fine, guys? What is the current standing deposit standing lending? Uh, it was 11 and 12, no? From what we say, okay, those are there, right? You can easily go to the central bank website, it's there. Current is 11 and 12. Yes, also remember I told you, use the central bank website more often. That is, uh, it helps a lot with understanding what is happening in the economy. Central bank also here and there, they publish stuff, guys. So, all, so what you all can usually do is, as an economic student, uh, go to the CBSL website. Usually, occasionally, I also use it. So I use it almost every day. Right? Just go to the CBSL website. There are different different tabs here. Uh, they have, for example, here. They, the first article here is about the domestic debt restructure. Here, uh, mm, there must be not everything might be relevant for you all. You can also go here, guys. You can go to here. This uh publications under I the policy rates are there. Current NCPI is at 2.1%, gone down. Uh policy rates are at 11 and 12. Uh this is the exchange rate. If you uh click on Sri Lanka economy as a snapshot, they'll give you the unemployment, everything uh else. Is it loading? No, I'll not go there. Uh then here when you go to publications, guys. You can see here the latest monetary policy report is there, the annual report is there, here financial system stability review, uh, the question that we uh, learned today. So you can see what and what they did here, the financial system stability review 2022. You just uh, have just uh, open and see what and what they did, everything what they did will be there. It's a, a bit of a big document, but there should be a summary here. Uh, where do they have? Just go through because I'm not going to go through all of this in detail. But just see, there are so many things that they would have done and uh, different, different things that they uh, did. There'll definitely be summaries. Okay. Then uh, you can also go to this guys, the press releases. So usually there are these monthly, uh, here the monetary policy review documents. Every time there is a monetary policy meeting, a monetary policy review is issued. Then you have uh, this one here external sector performance what now this sometimes i share with you all on the group and all okay so what happened to the external sector in july okay what happened to imports and exports what happened to worker remittances what happened to tourism all of those are there guys the central bank publishes then there is the uh, central bank also has a uh, under statistics they have a they have a daily report guys i don't know if you all know this every day central bank issues a report on what happened in that economy okay yeah? that's called the daily indicators you don't have to read it daily. That's okay here. Yeah? Uh, 21st September, that's the one latest one we have for now. So here yeah, in this, they say uh, what happened to the interest rates here, what happened to the money market, what happened to treasury bill rates, what happened to the share market, uh, what happened to energy and all, right? How did they uh, generate electricity on that day? Okay, was it thermal? Was it uh, hydro? Was it this? You know, so all of those are there. So this is the monthly, just one page uh, daily. Then they have monthly indicators also, guys. Here, yeah, the monthly indicators. This is a little bit of a bigger report. So every month, central bank issues. So they talk about here practically what has happened to all of this. Okay, what, ha what has happened to these sectors here? How much was the narrow money supply at the end of the year, end of this month? How much was the broad money supply? How much was M4? What happened to that here? What happened to exports? What happened to imports during that month? So all of these are there, guys. So as economic students, use this. Go and you don't have to memorize. I also don't memorize. Since I work, can I do all of this? I also, every, almost every day, 
I go to the central bank website, see what is there. Because remember, guys, your knowledge, you don't have to only learn for an exam. Don't make that mistake. Your learning is for yourself. Now, right now, you'll wonder only what is coming for the exam I'm going to learn. But remember, one day when you go out there to work and all, they are not going to ask you what is the demand equation, what is the determinants of demand. You need to practically know what's happening in the country, guys. Then only that is what your work will be. Your work is not going to be uh, define uh, SRR, uh, do uh, uh, credit creation calculation, and so you won't do those. Fine, for your exam, you learn that. But overall, always be inquisitive about what is happening around. That's the ideal way forward to get anything done. Okay, so that's uh, 2040. Uh, any questions there, Lamai? Chip? Okay, that was... Uh, there was a few good questions. Okay, so we'll wrap it there.